Hey, this is Ryan Callahan, uh, another episode of folks who stopped by the First Light office. Uh, with me today is the famous Mr. G, the British Invasion, Rob Gearing. Uh, he's got a really cool uh, company that just, uh, I guess we just first uh, started speaking with you a little over a year ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Spartan Precision Equipment and Really, it's, I always used to hunt with a bipod, a big Harris bipod, and they're great. I still recommend them to anybody, but they're very heavy. It's a lot of bulk uh, on the fore end of your rifle. Oftentimes, after years of packing that thing around, I, I would wonder if it was actually causing like a little more separation between my stock and my floating barrel on my 300 Win Mag, and, um, and I had kind of rarely taken that bipod uh, with me in, in recent years. And then uh, Mr. Gearing here contacted us and was talking about, you know, this new bipod and, and it is ultra lightweight, it is ultra packable. Um, I would say that, you know, some of the bells and whistles that you get with and they're nice bells and whistles, like fine, some fi more fine adjustment options on the big heavy bipods, but there really comes a point where you just cannot justify bringing those into the field. And the beautiful part about the Spartan bipod, or the Javelin bipod rather, uh, which it's Javelin by Spartan Precision Equipment, is you can always justify bringing it into the field because it is so light so compact that it takes up no room and it really adds no measurable weight. So, uh, Rob, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. What did, so, what did I not, not No, do? no, you've, you've killed it. <laughs> you've right. killed it. So, what a job. <laughs> no, basically, um, yeah, my background's climbing mountains. Uh, I mean, I love fly fishing, I love hunting, I love doing all of those things. Um, so, any tools to give me an excuse to be outdoors, frankly. Um, used to take a lot of people hunting in the UK, um, still do, but to a much lesser extent because I'm doing this now. Um, but I used to have a Harris bipod on my rifle and like you say, they're a brilliant tool. Um, it's just materials have changed and I wanted to simplify things. So what I did was basically use modern materials to produce a very simple answer to a shooting support system that really up your game when you're gonna hunt. So I got a Swedish guy into a Roebuck in the UK once and I didn't have a bipod on the rifle. He didn't feel comfortable taking the shot. So guess what, we didn't take the shot. I'm not the kind of person that will push somebody into an uncomfortable situation. I want dead deer on the ground at the end. But this guy's is just stupid simple. So carbon legs, five layers of carbon. It's um, machine 7,000 grade alloy. Um, with extendable legs, but literally uh, you can just pop it on the rifle with a magnet. It's that simple. So it's on and off and it's in your pocket and I use it when I need it. I have found that the magnets are really strong. Yeah, they originally were even stronger, but the problem with that is you want to avoid that click. You know when you're dropping legs on bipods, mm -hmm. and I've done it, and I'm sure you guys have all done it, you drop them, it goes click. We had a problem with the magnet and it goes Ting! and it doesn't need to be strong. All it needs to be is enough to hold the rifle and this is on the rifle when I take the shot and it's back in my pocket as soon as it's, as soon as it's off. So they work um, and 30,000 of these we've sold so nobody knew who we were two years ago so it's a bit of a success story but it's a hunting tool. If you're doing a lot of range work you don't need one of these. Right, go right. and get an atlas. Go and Wade get is your friend. This is this is this is for people that are seriously into the outdoor environment, where the ground is not flat, where you're hunting in mountains, and where you think, do I need a bipod or don't I? Then with that, there's no weight anyway. It's less than a less than your mobile phone. And you do have there's some adjustment here uh, as far as uh, so the leg locks out with the use of a magnet here. So you don't have legs kind of flopping back and forth, which is ideal. And then you have a little bit of a pivot here. And this is your connection point to the, your, the fore end of your rifle. 
Uh, and then you have a lever lock um, that, what did I do? Yeah, no, you've just taken the back off, that's all. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I twisted it the wrong yeah. way. So basically the lever lock. We'll have lock, to edit that. Yeah. <laughs> that goes just, oh, I might not even be in properly. Yeah. yeah, that's it, it goes that way. And then you just, the lever lock comes out. You wanna do that yes. again? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so there is some adjustment here. You know, this part is where your, uh, you know, your bipod mounts to the fore end of your rifle. And so there's a little bit of pivot. Um, and then your lever lock here on the back locks this in. And so it's rigid again. Um, you have some extension on your bipod legs and their uh, they're twist, right? Yeah, you can do, you can basically, these, these have got a simple trekking pole lock in them. So you've got some extendability on these. And the whole reason that we've got that cant block there is ground's never flat. If I'm uneven, I can still straighten the rifle. There's two ways of fitting the bipod. You have a hunt mode, which is that mode. So the bipod will orbit, or the rifle will orbit around the bipod. So you can actually track animals mm -hmm. moving. If you've got a longer shot to do, you just turn the bipod around and lock it in place. So now it's fixed. So if I've got over a 150 yard shot to do, there's enough movement in the carbon and everything and the flex to really have it in that lock position. And we do it backwards so the lever locks set back. So you can really lock yourself down into mm -hmm. place nice and tight. I like how you jumped over to yards for backward, oh, I'm, I'm backward American folks. Yeah, I had, yeah. To, I had to think about that quick. But it's a really versatile little tool. Um, these little legs, they swap out and we do leg kits. So they're just longer legs. So if you take the standard bipod, it's, it's, it, in my view, it's better because you can really tuck down. If you have got flat work to do, the longer one is more of a hunting tool, but this will do everything the long one does. You just get different leg kits. So you don't need all the leg kits. You set up for the leg kits that you need for the environment you hunt in, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, really delighted. It's just a piece of the story though. I mean, we, we make shooting support systems. So a bipod is just one element of it. And the kind of hunting we do in the UK, I might use this, let's say 10% of the time. Most of mine is woodland shooting, standing up and I use the tripod on two legs as a giant bipod effectively. So they're just lightweight answers. I, I sort of, I class it as like the 308 of a shooting support system. It'll do everything reasonably well, but it's, it's quite, you know, it's really focused on the hunting world. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, and yeah, I, I took a great buck with this last year and, and uh, I was actually telling Rob last night, it was almost an afterthought that I had shot it off the bipod because it is so light and so compact. I had, had really forgotten about it, but it was, in retrospect, it was like a big part of the scenario that that absolutely contributed to my success, last day of the season yeah. success even. So, uh, so yeah, I had a lot of years without a bipod and, and now I'm back into it because this just fits my hunting style a lot more and it's lighter. Now, really cool thing also, be an unabashed salesman is you're going to be able to find these at firstlight.com because we have, you know, mother tested and approved really. So hugely excited about that guys. Yes. Um, and uh, really, really delighted to partner up with you guys on that. Um, we're pretty passionate about your ethos and, mm -hmm. uh, and your gear. We love this gear and I'm not saying that because I just love merino wool. So there's a lot of good merino Excellent. wool out there, but that you, you're, you're doing some great gear and we really, really enjoy that. We really enjoy working with you, but this really fits sort of our kind of culture as a hunting tool. Um, you, uh, you really smell like campfire smoke. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and I did have a bath last night. <laughs> so you witnessed it. <laughs> so what, uh, what have you been doing? What have I been doing? I've been traveling around America for the last four weeks um, in this northwest area, I've literally just clocked over 5,000 miles in that rather smashed up car out there um, after hitting a hailstorm and I've had a wonderful time and I'm sorry I'm probably a bit offensive now but I have literally been living in the woods 
um, for most of the time, trying out our gear actually. So uh, that's been pretty exciting, getting a bit of fishing in when I get a chance. I did some good fishing with you last yes. night, which was hugely entertaining. Um, but no, really enjoyed it, met some wonderful people. Um, looking at establishing a Spartan Inc. now, because either a home in Montana or Idaho would suit us. And clearly there's a huge interest in what we're doing over here. And uh, yeah, we, need to, we want to be part of it. We want to be in a country where we feel loved. Yes. Um, <laughs> and in the UK, sadly, the minute you mention rifles or hunting, it's, it's a tough one. You know, we're, um, we've, we've got a bit of work to do over there. Yeah. 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 And so where have you been camping over here? So I was in the Cascades before I came down here. So I met a few friends for a barbecue and then went straight back into the Cascades and um, spent a few nights there um, living in the woods. I was in Utah, um, Missoula, uh, all over the place, really. So I've done a great big circuit, circuit Wyoming. Um, started in Colorado, met the Kifaru guys. Kifaru, sorry. Sorry, guys. Um, had a little podcast with those guys and then moved up, went to Utah, did a ladies hunting training camp, which was quite entertaining. Um, basically taught a load of girls to how to use this system because mm -hmm. a lot of them had done hunting and really they'd learned on a flat table. And my, my view, I feel really strong about this. I say, it ain't flat up there, guys. It's, it's, yes. So let's forget the table. So we start with a bipod, we start with the sticks, tripod. I simulated a wounded elk, could have been anything, 250 yards up a hill, took a bad shot, and then they had to come recompose themselves and then get back onto it another 50 yards up the road, kill the elk. Every one of those girls did it. I was hugely proud. The nice thing about women is they listen and they come to it with no ego or arrogance and they just want to learn and uh, yes. those girls killed it. So. Uh, if I could have students like that every time, I'd be delighted. Yes, it makes your job easy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I mean, either shooting off a bipod and you have a, a tripod system, like you said, I, like in the UK, you guys are doing a lot of, you know, uh, you know you're shooting in brush, so you have yeah, standing. We, we have a lot of wood, um, so a lot of close shots. It's rare I'll take a shot over 100 meters, whatever that is in yards. And so I don't like to call it a tripod because that's just part of what it is. I will use this on longer legs um, as a giant bipod, really, because it's very quick. And with that ball joint at the top, I got that idea because we drive a lot of manuals at home and I was driving my Audi and I thought, that's what I need. Nice. I need that movement. And that little ball is hugely um, adaptable. So. This, this, this is a module, right? The head is the heart of the unit. You can have little legs, mountain-sized legs, woodland legs. They're all telescopic. It's Austrian carbon. It's all 7,000 grade alloy. It's beautifully made. And I can say that without sounding arrogant because I didn't make it. And it might be my idea, but far brighter people have designed this stuff and turned it into what it is. But having that little active ball on the top there, this is actually effectively a very effective little bipod too. And guys, you do not need to buy a javelin and one of these. You pick what you need that serves your best purpose. And we're always happy to speak to people on the phone and help guide them if they talk to us and say, this is what I'm gonna go and do this. I'm after an elk and this is the environment. We can help steer them in the right direction. But the whole, we're doing a whole facet of tools and you pick what best serves your requirements. You know, you mm -hmm. don't need to go and buy three sets of legs it's just because two of them are going to be getting in there and gathering dust. That's my view anyway. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, we did a bit with your San Jose Police Force with this. So this has got some military applications as well, but it's, this is very much a hunting tool. This migrates across between the two. And but even between this hunting tool and this hunting tool, they're not going to do the job for you. You've got to no, practice. No, no, you've right? got to practice. Yeah. You've got to practice, but it definitely... It makes, oh look, I'm not a brilliant shot, but this, this ups my game. And yep. at the end of the day, I think we're all focused on making sure we've got a dead animal at the end of the day. And if you do enough shooting, sadly, that's not always gonna be the case. And I'm as guilty as the next person there. So what was important for me was making tools to enable me to take a difficult shot. So I came back, I was in New Zealand um, in November. We were doing some tar, hunting tar. And the guy that I was with said, oh, there is not a bipod that works here, mate. You know, 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely adamant. I said, right, okay. Well, two tar later, needless to say, I didn't get the bipod back. He said, you just killed it because, you know, we're on rocks, we're on this, you've got to get tucked down and uh, the stuff works. The stuff works because we shoot a lot of deer and we, that's our game. We don't spend a lot of time on the ranges. The only time you find me on a range is if I've taken a bad shot on, I'm questioning something in the rifle. Yeah. Everything else is managing deer for us. Very different. We don't have this fantastic landscape you've got here. Um, you know, I'm pretty envious. Can I move? <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> that's the nice part about your camping, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Like you're yeah. on public land the whole time and you've got to do your fishing on public land. And well, you, you have a huge um, luxury in this. Pub- in it, it's, I shouldn't use the look, that's probably the wrong word, but. We don't, uh, coming from the UK, we do not have public land. Well, we have public land, but we don't have public land that we can use like you guys can. And the fact that anybody here can go and get a tag and go out into this beautiful environment and do what you guys do is, is really tremendous. I mean, absolutely tremendous. And people often ask me, why are you so passionate about the American problem? And I said, well, because I come from an environment where we don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. You know, we really do not have this. So what effectively happens in the UK is hunting's become, well, not become, it's always been extremely elitist. I live on a uh, a forest that was Ashdown Forest, which had a 27-mile perimeter fence, a ditch dug, with a posting uh, fence dug in so all the animals could have jumped in but couldn't get out. Who was that done for? Henry VIII. Right? If a little I bit wanted, of history there. Yeah, if I wanted to go and hunt, so 1500 and something, if I wanted to go and hunt in, on Henry VIII's land, I'd have been lucky to get away with my life if uh, I'd caught a deer. So, ironically, that land is now public, but we can't use it for anything. We mm. can go walking on it, you might get a license to ride a horse, but we can't shoot on it. And actually it's become a huge problem because there's so many deer. How do we manage the deer? Car accidents, right? So the mm. road traffic accidents involving deer it's just, it's got completely out of control. So, uh, land so I mean, what, what is your, I mean, you've got like a very, where you, sorry, okay. So it, it's always been a very elitist activity. Yeah. And what is the public perception of hunting? Pretty negative, generally, I would say, but that's probably our fault for B, because it's elitist, we haven't done a good job at selling the benefits of hunting, um, done a really poor job at it actually, and it's been very much about the trophies and the results, not really about the important stuff, in my view, which is about good organic produce at the mm-hmm. end of the day. Um, that's becoming more and more the way forward. I know a lot of people in the UK that are really pushing that hard and doing a very good job, like the Pace Brothers, for example, are really you know, promoting what hunting's really about. I'm not a fan of calling hunting sport. That's kicking a ball or playing mm-hmm. a game of tennis, in my view. It's a passion, it's a way of life. And I think it's in most of our DNA if we dig deep enough. Um, and it's probably our fault for not educating people well enough to bring the benefits of what hunting does do for the whole community. You take grouse moors, for example. So grouse in the UK now are really only where hunting is done because they're managed and they're looked after and they're supported and the predators are controlled. But it's not only a benefit to the grouse, it's a benefit to the whole moor. You've got the seabirds coming back, you've got a lot of other wildlife that comes in because it's a managed environment. The minute you take the hunting away, that landscape changes and Mm -hmm. with it goes a lot of the wildlife. Now, I I only know the word moor from Hound of the Baskerville, right? So can you explain what a moor is? Right, so a moor is, we call it a moor, it's it's basically a heather-covered hill or a series of heather-covered hills and grouse feed off heather. As chicks, they need a good insect life. For the first few weeks of their life, they have to live off insects. and then they move over to the grouse and they have to measure, they have to manage that more. So they do controlled burns. So they'll burn a hillside. So basically take the grouse back, um, uh, sorry, take them all back and establish young growth. Mm-hmm. And they need that young growth yeah. for the grouse. If they don't get the young growth and the whole moor is the same age, guess what? You don't have any grouse. 
So yeah. it needs to be managed. Kills the ground cover. You have Kills less the ground cover, yeah. Life. And you've got no food for the young grouse. And they're very susceptible to weather, which clearly we can't do anything about. If you have a very wet um, summer, you'll lose a lot of them. But this year should be excellent because we've had such a grand summer up there. So the weather's good, the food will be good, and there'll be a lot of insect life. So what, uh, yeah, I mean, fire is a natural part of the landscape. Absolutely. Right? So if you're going to manage something, you know, California here, if you're paying attention, they're reaping the benefits of a zero fire tolerance policy. And it's a real hot place. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's a natural event, isn't it? If you, if you allow it long enough, there are going to be fire, and there needs to be to reestablish growth. Anybody that doesn't understand that needs to go and read up a bit. Yeah, I, yeah. I will show you more elk than you can uh, shake a stick at yeah. in, a, in an old burn. Yeah. Um, well, California but, better wake up to that. Yeah. What, uh, so what, what other, you have a very diverse hunting background and fishing background. So I know you've spent a lot of time in South America, Africa, ju just South Africa? Um, for hunting? Or? Yeah, I've not done any, I've not done any real, I've done a bit of hunting in South Africa. Look, it's, to me, it's, it's basically there's a lot of beef farmers that have gone over to raising game. Mm -hmm. Now, I can get that, I completely get that. It's not naturally what I want to be doing, but I can really understand and relate to it. Would I rather be a dairy cow or an eland that's been farmed and probably grows seven or eight years and then get taken out? I know which I'd go for, eland every time. So, and look, nothing gets wasted. It's all eaten, it's all processed, it's just, it's just a different type of mm -hmm. farming, really, my view. And then um, uh, uh, lots of time in New Zealand, right? Lots of time in New Zealand, spent a huge amount of time in New Zealand, fly fishing, done a bit of hunting over there, love that, love that um, countryside, love the people and the environment. As I say, a lot of time in Patagonia. In Patagonia, I've done uh, boar hunting and red deer, um, but really my big passion over there was climbing mountains. That's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was a little bit younger then, but, and I go, I try and get back every year to fly fish, and then I can properly switch off. You know, that's yes. my time. So I get 10 days in the middle of Patagonia and nobody's gonna get hold of me then. Right. That's, and that, that's yeah, nice. It's hunting with a fly rod. Yeah, yeah. so I, so I absolutely in, love uh, it. Last night, uh, you ran down, got a fishing license, like a one-day license. No, I got three days. Oh, did you? Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, we threw a couple of beers in the cooler yeah. and drove over the hill yeah. and, and proceeded to stop at some point and fish, right? Yeah, and what a place. What a fantastic bit of water. I mean, public land again, eh? Yes. Right? So if I wanted to fish like that in the UK, I'd be spending hundreds of pounds. Hundreds. Well, yeah, so comparatively, the process that we went through last night um, uh, to other areas that you've got to hunt and fish, like how does it stack up management-wise? Or from, from what you can tell, it, it's well, a very small experience. But. So that day's license cost me 15 bucks, right? I got my, more than my money's worth out of it. It's just, it's just a, a beautiful environment. I honestly would have paid $15 to watch you. I needed a shower. That yeah, was great. Yeah. But, uh, but basically, in a nutshell, it, it, because we live in the UK on a tiny island with a lot of people, everything like that is managed and privately owned. Um, well, let's say rivers wise, almost all privately owned. So I'd have to book for a day's fishing, which would cost me literally hundreds of pounds uh, to sort of compete with what we did yesterday. Okay. And I get that for 15 bucks. That's that's a huge benefit, and uh, what a place, what a place, beautiful. Yeah. So how does it compare? Well, it's very difficult to judge those two because your environment is so spectacular here. You're quite blown, blown away with, by the vista everywhere you look, you've just got something going on. And we just don't have anything that competes with this in the UK. I mean, Scotland's great, and where I live is lovely, but it's, it's woodland, you can't see more than a few hundred yards for trees normally. So it's a great experience and I feel privileged to have had a chance to sort of fish on such a great river like that. So yeah, last night, you know, after we ran down, got a license, uh, 15 bucks, and we 
on, I mean, we fished a spot that I hadn't fished before, but oh, it's a beautiful bit. Looked looked at the time on the clock yeah. and how much we had, and yeah. thought, well, we better stop here. Yeah. Um, and we caught some fish, and you uh, you definitely hit the the high end of the cutthroat trout. I was I was goes. fishing. I spent about probably twenty minutes round a boulder, small boulder, and it was no more than like a couple of foot from the bank. I mean. It's, yeah, I would have expected them to be moving more into the middle by that sort of time. And there were three fish, just like we call it, top and tailing. Just and I caught a couple. I foul hooked one, didn't I? And that yeah. I thought I'd got a monster, <laughs> and it ended up being about this big. And then um, I was fishing a dry fly, and I think you've got to be so accurate with those fish. And I'm not brilliantly accurate, but they were just not taking more than sort of like a four inch zone, I think, above them, and they weren't looking anywhere else. And well, this one, he just sipped it off the surface. Yes. You were there, didn't you? It was great. And whoa, what a fish. I mean, what a beautiful fish. And he did take me down the river, but I probably Mr. needed it. some fantastic pictures of uh, Mr. G here swimming with his fly rod up in the air and, and eventually a fish up in the air. Yeah. Yeah, Which I thought uh, was fun. It was a memorable occasion and a beautiful, a beautiful fish with a real, yeah, you can see why they're called cutthroat. It's yeah. A real blood line along here. Uh, and then, yeah, so comparatively, um, you know, in the UK, you're, you're renting a beat or renting a stretch of river. Yeah, we call them beats. And you'll get your buy, you'll rent your beat for the day, or you might have a membership or something, so you have a yearly, a yearly membership. And you fish that beat, and um, I mean, we don't have anything to compare with what we did yesterday. We have chalk streams, which are equally great fun and mm -hmm. beautiful setting, but it's much more manicured. You know, it's, it, you can see there, it's, it's, it's nature that's been managed in a major, major way. So you've got these lovely um, chalk streams running through farmland and such like, still beautiful places. You'll see roe deer, you'll see a lot of wildlife, barn owls and things. So, it's a great nature haven, but yeah, it has to be more processed because we've got such a high population and l less water relative to the number mm -hmm. of people we have. So I can understand that, and it's actually managed very, very well, but it's just hugely expensive. Right. Um, so again, it cuts down on you the amount of participants. Yeah, right? yeah, you cannot, you cannot get young people into this because, frankly, unless they're from a sort of a wealthy background, they're never going to be able to afford to do it. And I think that's really sad because if they don't get into it, the countryside has little value to them. Yeah, how, then, how do they appreciate yeah, it? And if, if that's what's growing up and blah, 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 and they, these people are turning into be adults and they're going to have no value to this ground, what happens to it? So I've been very, I've been very active with my kids at sort of exposing them to all of these things from a very early age. They've, I'm really proud of a couple of things, and one is they've never had a beach holiday. They probably hate me for it, but they've always they come on climbing trips. They've been into India. They've been to you know up with the Inuit in Pavunyatuk and places. So they've been really exposed to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different environments from a really early age. And do you know what? It's completely recalibrated their minds, which is great. Yeah. So Jenna, for example, when she left school, she got great great qualifications. Offered a place at Durham University. It's a top uni and. What she say? She said, Dad, I'm, I'm off to Patagonia. And I said, do you know what, Jenna? Good on you. So she bailed out, went down there, and then came back and look, she's working for herself as a bronze artist now, but she does a lot of hunting, and she's, yeah, she's, she's living a full active life, and she really gets it. She's very into her dogs. And all of my kids are the same way. They're very... It has a little more appreciation nature for what's out there. Yeah, and know where food comes from. Yes. I mean, it, isn't it scary? We've got, we've got kids growing up in London that, honestly, I thought this was a joke, but they really don't know where an egg or milk comes from. Can you believe that? No. Who's to blame Unfortunately, for Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. But, it, yeah, it seems made up. Yeah, but who's to blame for that? We are, yeah. you know, at the end of the day. Uh, so, uh, you guys say you, you do a lot of deer management. What, what type of deer are you talking about? So, there's, there's really six species of deer in the, in the UK, three of which are considered native. Fallow, actually, probably, well, they're considered native because they've been there for a long time, but they came over either with the Normans or the Romans. Um, but we've got, so we've got Fallow, Roe, and Muntjac, where we're based. 
that's all the species we look after, but we have a huge problem with them because a lot of that land is arable crops mm -hmm. and fallow are grazers um, and they will go through and clear the farmer's crops out in a very quick space of time. So it's a job for us. Um, and there's eight deer stalkers uh, where I'm sort of, I manage two estates with those guys and we'll manage effectively between probably 280 and 320 deer a year. So wow. we're doing a lot of deer management. Um, all of that gain goes into the industry. It's sold as an organic meat, so it's great. So that pays for a lot of the costs and things. So our meat is sold to a game dealer. And then the, a lot of the meat goes over to France and Germany. But more and more people in the UK are really understanding the value of good organic meat now. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, my favourite hunting is definitely row stalking. I love row stalking, about the size of probably a medium-sized dog. Yeah. Um, and they are just a wonderful animal. I, I love hunting them. I love watching them. And what's love the major eating. trait differences between the fallow and the roe and the moon jack? Right, moonjack never stop moving. Um, they're a big pest in the UK. They're non-native, um, so they they cause a lot of problems. They're normally pregnant within a few days of giving birth, so there's no oh. season on them. They do taste good. Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah. Really, really top end meat. Um, the continental guys like to come over and hunt them. They're quite exciting to hunt because they're always on the move and they're, you, you've really got to be quick on them. Um, fallow are obviously much bigger. Uh, pelmeted look like a mini version of your moose, uh -huh. I guess. Um, again, excellent eating. Um, and they're the biggest problem. The row, I'm very fond of the row. They're, they're, a, they're a browser rather than a grazer. Um, and they're just a beautiful animal, um, and they're fairly solitary. You'll get them in small numbers. Fallow, you could find them in almost, we call them parcels, but like a herd of 50 okay. is not uncommon. Um, very hard, though, uh, to get a handle on them because they will move and, uh, and they'll, they'll cover a lot of ground. But. Okay. And then, so, yeah, how does, I guess, the, how does... I guess in your circle, what's the standard operating procedure for going out on a hunt? And, and as far as access, um, you know, limits, tag, are there, is, are there, Nothing. Is there a tag system? Right. Is it's there... totally different, completely on its head to where you guys are. So that land that I'm hunting on is properly private land, mm -hmm. right? Nobody, unless they had permission, right, from the landowner would hunt on there. You know, that would be, that would be considered poaching in a serious way, it's a prison sentence. Yeah. So I'm really fortunate because I, I know landowners and they want us to manage deer, but I'm a lucky person. Another Rob Gearing that wasn't in such a fortunate position might never get that opportunity to hunt. Mm -hmm. um, so I consider myself really lucky to be able to do that. But yeah, no tags. The eight guys will manage those deer. We will have clients come in. Uh, guys from America will come and hunt. Uh, guys from Europe will come and hunt. Um, and we'll take clients out. Um, a lot of it's, you know, one stalker, one deer hunter with one, you know, a guide yep. um, with one client. Sometimes what we'll do, we'll do managed days where because of the environment, if you need to get on a handle on the numbers, we'll put people up in seats or towers mm -hmm. and we'll move through slowly and you know, they've got to be on it because you don't get a lot of opportunity, but it's a good way to get, get on top of the numbers. Mm -hmm. But we have no predators in the UK. We don't have, our bear went a long time ago, our wolves all went, right? We have nothing to manage the deer. So we have this huge problem with road traffic accidents, not good for the cars, but equally pretty disastrous for the deer as well. You see a lot of deer moving around with three legs, uh -huh. Shoulders gone, you know, it's pretty rough. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you, you have to go through, uh, you find an estate that has a hunting program. It, exactly. There are There is the Forestry Commission, so this is the one way to probably get on what we class as public land. But you'd have to pay 
to mm -hmm. hunt and it will be expensive. So you go out with one of the forestry rangers. What we do have in the UK, which is very good and I'm a big supporter of it, is we have three colleges in the UK, one in the south, one in the Midlands and well, uh, uh, Lake District and one in Scotland. And they teach what we probably argue is professional hunters, professional deer managers and pest control managers or foresters. So those guys will go into a private estate and they will be responsible for managing the deer, the vermin and such like. And the standard of those young guys and girls, a lot of girls doing it now, is very good. Um, hugely impressed with what comes out the other end. You know, that's a proper college course um, and they do a fantastic job and we support them. Certainly in the two lower colleges, we supply them with uh, some gear and such. We're a little company, so we can't afford to do much, but we give them bipods and such like. And I go and do a few talks at the colleges. Not that I'm qualified to do it, but I do my best. But they'll listen. They so listen. They listen to any bull yeah. dog. Sorry. But um, no, it, it's, 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 it's good. And you, you're putting something back in. But those guys are really our future. And what I say to them, I say, look, hunting is, you're taking, you're often taking people out to get them out of their environment and put them in something they're uncomfortable in. And ultimately, however you look at it, we're doing it for our personal pleasure as well. Mm -hmm. I, I love pushing myself. And I said, and the people, your clients, really are there to be entertained. Yep. So shooting the animal is almost secondary. Some of the best days hunting I've been out on have resulted in nothing being killed but it's been a fantastic adventure. And I'm absolutely in love with the adventure of being in an environment like this. And uh, yeah, great if you get a result, but if you've got a result every time, maybe the magic wouldn't be quite there. Oh, without, yeah. without yeah. a question. I mean, more and more, and we spoke about this a little bit yesterday, is if I have a predetermined result this yeah. way, yeah. I walk this way. Yeah. And you've lost it. You've, I, if your mindset is that way, you really, I think you're missing what it's all about. Look, we had a fantastic night last night. We ended up catching a, a beautiful fish. We'd have still had a great time on that river trying to catch beautiful fish. Yes. Yeah, I, don't, I wasn't sitting there thinking, God, this is gonna be rotten if I don't land. I'm gonna lose my $15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was just blessed to be in an environment like that. So. Fantastic, bring so it on. On the, uh, on the estates, the, because when you guys are, are managing deer without hunters, without clients, paid, paid folks, that meat then, it still belongs to the estate, so, correct? Yeah, it's all sold straight back into the, and this is where we differ from America again. That meat ends up on anybody's plate who's prepared to pay for it. Which yeah. is great, all right? And people are really starting to appreciate organic meat, right? I, I, you know, I have the luxury of not having to buy what I consider not very good quality meat. Mm -hmm. We talked about chicken breast yesterday. Yes. Skin chicken breast. I mean, what? Come on. You know, we need a bit more than that. So I pretty much now, if I'm going to eat red meat, it's venison that either is shot by one of the other lads, me or Jenna, and uh, we've got a nice mince. So, so we'll keep one back now and again, you know, and yep. we've got enough for ourselves and the rest goes into the game larder. And then, so I guess, how does the sale process work? So you have a game dealer's license, you have game dealers all over the country, and that's exactly, so they'll come and pick up pheasants, grouse, uh, pigeons, rabbits, deer, and then they have established networks to sell that into good quality butchers, I would say, which are coming back in the UK, which is great. Keep on coming, lads. Yes. They were dying. They were dying 15 years ago. Nobody wanted to go to a butcher because we've got the mafia supermarkets, guys. And you probably have it here as well. And I just, you know, they look after our insurance. They deliver your food. They do. People don't even think when they buy a piece of meat in plastic that it was once living, right? Yeah. There's and a I'm, little I'm, bit of a disconnect. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can even be guilty of it. You know, it's just, you think, oh, forget. Well, if you've done the whole process, I actually turn it on its head and think, if you want to eat meat, you need to come out and do the whole process. Right? Yeah. Otherwise, you shouldn't eat it. You, know, you don't deserve to eat it. You could turn that... Hard to appreciate it the way that we do. Yeah, yeah. If your version of meat is the Burger King sandwich. Well, I mean, hard to imagine that that 
was an animal. Well, okay. and we're all guilty. I mean, I, an old Inuit boy said to me once, I'm really fortunate to spend some time with some guy, some, both sadly dead now, but dog sleds, we did it properly. We were living in igloos and things. And this guy just said to me, he said, look, you guys give me, you know, rubbish all the time. We've been doing this for 8,000 years and arguably longer. The stuff keeps coming back. Shoot a couple of belugas every year. We use everything. And actually, beluga, wow, everything we were eating on that trip was raw. I mean, properly, nothing's cooked. Um, but they really had a good handle on it. And I thought, well, who's, who's more distant? Who's more... We are. Mm. We, we've introduced the supermarkets and we critique these people. Okay. Unfortunately, when you've got seven... So are you, are you seeing any more... So we talked about how, you know, there's very few hunters. It's, it's perceived as just an elitist pursuit. Um, the public perception isn't super warm. Are you seeing a change in that public perception when you bring up the, the food argument? There's, I see that here. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm an optimistic person, I'd say. So there'd be plenty of people that argue against it, but I think there are people in the UK and indeed, indeed Europe that are doing a fantastic job at promoting our passion. Not our sport, our passion. And I wish the rifle industry and the optics industry and all the companies that rely on people to buy rifles, bows, whatever, would actually support them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because guess what? If they don't, they won't be selling any rifles, right? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm 55 now, diminishing horizons. My views are I want to spend as many days as I can out there. So I say to my kids, I say, guys, you really need to be promoting this because it's something good. It, I, I think we're doing something pretty wholesome. Nobody likes killing things. Mm -hmm. right? I honestly, well, maybe people do, but I don't. I'm always a bit sad when I kill something, but I like, I value the result more than the upset in killing something, if that makes sense. You yeah. know, so for me, it's, I love hunting row. I love watching them, but I, I love eating them too. And I'd be foolish of me to say anything else. You know, a lovely row fillet is is difficult to beat mm -hmm. and it's hugely rewarding and I've done the whole job you know I've got it skinned it out whatever cooked it that's a great story that's and that there's something in me that makes me feel like I provided maybe it's quite simple I don't know but it's just the word yeah, absolutely one. but we have we have some good people coming on board, as I say, like the Pace Brothers, like there's this guy, I think we were talking about it earlier, um, always hunting, underscore DK. He's doing a brilliant job in Denmark and he's making hunting sexy again. You know, and he said, basically, he said, if I, when I was growing up, if I went into Copenhagen wearing a camo jacket, I, I would almost get spat at, I mean, not, but you know, mm -hmm. people didn't like it. He said, now if I go into Copenhagen, I meet six people and have a beer, well, they all want to buy me beers once, um, once they know I'm a hunter and five of them will want to learn to how to hunt and three of them will be women, mums. That's amazing. So that's, they've turned it. So we could all do well from listening to those guys. It's got nothing wrong with trophies, but the trophy should be a byproduct. You know, eating great meat should be what it's all about. Yes. If we have the luxury to be able to do it. But when you've got seven billion people on the planet, there is a place for intensive farming. You know, yep. without that, we'd have big problems. So maybe I'm looking at it through a very narrow channel, but all the time I'm able out to go out there and hunt and provide and eat really good quality food. Why not? Now, as far as like, you know, um, ease of hunting goes, if you're not in your uh, position, you know, where you, you know some landowners and you're, you've been you know, invited at some point to take part in the management process, where, where do you go? Like, what, yeah, what's that, the easiest place? Do you go it, to Ireland or yeah, New Zealand or what? I, Ireland's got some fantastic hunting and some great people managing some great places over there, really good characters like Will O'Mara and, uh, and such like from Four Outdoors. Brilliant, really passionate about what he does. UK, you can buy hunting just like you can buy rivers, but you can get any, anybody can go, if they've got the money, can go and say, I want to go and go hunting. Mm -hmm. um, are some of them fit for purpose? You probably say the same in the States. No, absolutely not. Most of them like to do their homework first and most of them come there as much to learn and get the education and learn about the nature. Uh, those are the right people that do it. I've had the odd people that have gone, 
oh, they're just desperate to kill something. You soon learn, you know, you soon weed them out. My son, for example, is 14 and he said, Dad, I think, um, I think I want to try this deer stalking before I don't want to do it, which I thought was really adult of him. We went out and luckily he shot a little muntjac and that night he skinned it all out and phoned his mates up and cooked it. I know, what a brilliant story. Yes. You know, he'll never, ever forget that day. Never, ever forget that day. Nor with his mates. That was a brilliant, I was hugely proud of him. But, you know, if his, if his mates, his buddies don't have the money and the access... Then they, they won't get the opportunity. And, and where, but where does that opportunity exist? You know, obviously you got a small taste of what I am, for better or worse, very accustomed to, right? Well, I'm, you... I, I'm I, very I, passionate I, about the system that we have over here. I'm... I, it's for better, Ryan. It, it, it's, it, in my view, looking at it from the other side of the pond, what you've got here is so much better than what we have in Europe. And now, I know things aren't black and white, they never are, there's grey areas, but crikey, do not let that go, right? Yeah. I'm on the other side of the fence. So you're speaking to somebody that sees it without public land, right? 90% of the people that buy your gear and probably buy my gear rely on public land. You watch this space, right? It's yeah. a slippery, slippery site. I don't care what anybody says. What they agree or what your government agree now and say, oh, no, no, this is just, this is going to be managed better. In 10 years' time, they go, oh, well, actually, we've done a bit of fracking here or we've got some gas or we've got some, by the way, we're going to have to fence this. <sighs> Come on, we're not naive, right? Mm. You have... You have a fantastic asset in your land here, right? And uh, yeah, from a British perspective, why am I so passionate about it? Because there's a lot of young Rob Gearings on this side of the pond too that will not get that opportunity and indeed don't get that opportunity in the UK. Yeah, yeah. so give them, give them that chance. Get them off those bloody computers and get them out in the woods playing, right? You know, what we did yeah. yesterday was fantastic. And most kids, if they get the chance to do that, it, it's there. They love it. All you need to do is flick that switch. Should be an educational program where they all have to go and experience things. And my climbing buddy Simon Yates didn't start climbing until his sort of early twenties because he was brought up in a city and a pretty shitty place really, and didn't have a brilliant upbringing. And, he, and then he discovered the Lake District, and that was it. That was that switch. He never went back. Went off and did his science degree, very bright guy. And then his granny was a shoemaker, did his degree, and then his family said, oh, you're going to go and get a good job now, Simon. And he said, no, I'm going to go and climb mountains. And yeah. that's what he's still doing. And bless him, good on him, you know? Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, for so many people, they just don't... There's opportunities out there, and they don't know what they are or how to get to them. Yeah, uh, and you, but you have... You have great, like that ladies' hunt camp that I did over here, There's, it's much easier to channel people in mm -hmm. on this side of the pond. Um, in the UK, I didn't, I didn't come from a hunting family, right? So I took climbing up instead because that was my excuse to be out in nature. I, I discovered hunting later. You know, sure, I had an air gun and things and we go and shoot a few rabbits, but I didn't seriously get into deer hunting until my late 20s. And then I thought, well, this is just... This is just brilliant. I wish I'd discovered it earlier. Mm -hmm. If I'd grown up in a farming family or in a wealthy family or whatever that had land, I would have, I'd have been out there at the age of probably six or seven doing what... I, I remember as a kid, tiny kid, having a fascination with flies. That was the only thing I got close to flies. I'd go and buy flies. I didn't, didn't have the opportunity to go fly fishing. So I had a collection of flies when I was about six or seven. I, met these, oh, I thought, these are great. It's pretty sad, really. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting, yeah. yeah. So it took me like 25 years to actually use flies. And, uh, yeah. and then when I discovered that, I, oh, it was no so there's So this is a, a huge topic that we really can't get into, but just there's uh, the state representative out of Utah, uh, Mike Lee, right now, who um, is pitching this story uh, that our public lands are the king's lands and in order to get out of this royal system and he's making these uh ties to you know now the united kingdom but really the british empire right um yeah 
and that we need to break out of that system because these lands aren't truly ours and well, uh, you if, can't go out there. You've lost me already and it sounds like a pretty weak <laughs> argument, right? You know, you haven't had a king for, well, you've never had a king apart from, well, well, I was doing a podcast the other day with Ryan Avery at Rockside, so I'm surprised you have a Brit here on July the 4th. But uh, yes. yeah, look, yeah, I, I can see it from both sides. And I'm yeah, we call that Independence Day, yeah. not July the 4th, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. But uh, I, I, I can see it from both sides of the fence, limited. You know, I've not lived in the US, clearly, but your system works far better than ours does, right? Ours works because it's managed, it's paid for, blah, blah, blah. But it, the big issue is people with little money in their pocket won't get the chance to do what you can do here. And that's the end result. That's, that's, you've got an opportunity here to do some fantastic things. So I'm, from, from, I mean, the reality is you guys have been around a lot longer than we yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we've had time to screw it up a bit more. Yeah, and, um, and also think through it a little bit. So if you have like any closing thoughts as far as if, you know, you, not to put words in your mouth here, but it seems like you enjoy the system, you enjoy the opportunity. If, if there's anything, any pointers that you'd like to make to see this stuff continue? I, I think you've got to fight your corner. Um, I don't know how you do that, but I think you've got to get people on side to understand the potential loss that's at stake here. Um, if you allow this land to be controlled by anybody other than your public, you know, the, the system has worked for a few hundred years now, right? Yeah. Why change it? Yes, I'm sure it's not perfect and I don't want to get involved. Well, we've had some major changes yeah. in those yeah. 200 years. Like it, we used to be able to sell game meat as well. Yeah. We just did but, a real poor job of managing that system, yeah. right? So. So, so you need to tune things, but don't change it completely. It works, you know. They, I, it's, I, I fished in America for a long time. You know, I, you buy your ticket and you know, everything goes. It's, it's a great system. New Zealand has it. I'm sure there's a lot of people in New Zealand that will say it's not ideal, but you've still got people that can go and hunt fantastic, fantastic mountain ranges just by buying a permit. You know, that's a huge asset. In the UK, I'd love a big chunk of land to be turned back into a public land where there is some system where you can buy some tags. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen because we're so much further down that down that track than you are. Yeah, we're not going to go backwards. There are people that are turning land back into certain wild environments, and there's arguments on both sides of the fence on that one. But yeah, to to finish up, really, Ryan, I think don't change what works. And I'm sure a lot of people say, but it doesn't work properly. Well, watch this space. It won't work very bloody well either if you allow it to go into private ownership and. Fences start going up and fracking and gas and oil and y y y wouldn't it be a shame if you couldn't go and play on that hill again? Well, I just wouldn't be living here. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So fight it. And you guys are doing a good job on it. And that's really I like your clothing, but I also like your ethos. And I think, as I for me, I'm not trying to build an empire in what we do. And I think. I say it's passion before business for me. I don't need 20 million quid in the bank. Nice to have, but. I, I, I need, it's time for me out there. So this enables me to do the things I really enjoy. And I, I sense that in, in First Light's DNA that there's a lot of passion here and there's a lot of people fighting the corner of the hunters and the people that just enjoy nature. So keep it up. All right, will do. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for uh, coming in. I oh, really appreciate it. Really. Get me out fishing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, we will, you know, keep doing these as much as you guys keep tuning in and, and you know, please leave uh, any questions, comments uh, on, um, you know, our social media channels and, and you can always write into info at firstlight.com. Um, also, you know, as far as like gear tested and approved products, uh, the Javelin Bipod by Spartan Precision Equipment is... But don't buy this from me, guys. Buy that from these guys. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much and thanks for stopping by. Very good. Loved it. Loved it. Excellent. Thank you.